Sorry, mine's a little finicky, so I see why. And please do let us know if you're having trouble uh, hearing us. We're going to project our voices as best we can, and um, we'll try to stay as close to Renee's camera as possible. All right, so oh, I'm So I can start. My phone is being okay. Yeah, I think we're good. So I'm sorry. That, I don't know why it's being that way.
are the starting point that allows for the plan to grasp the goals, but also for the plan to become a part of the plan. And lastly, we just want to quickly point out these wonderful sabotages for skills, protective feet. These sabotages are features that are already active, purchased online, but then then modified to fit within the PC kind of the parameter here in the front um, to make them a part of the site and to become a part of the site. And you can see here in the whole screen, there's a lot going on. Um, you know, there are class artists and padding. This is actually padding with metal and it's reinforced and like there's an additional layer. Um, but all of these pieces are pieces that Michael himself wears, and this is a sword that he made that complies with the SCA safety standards for combat. Um, but, you know, it's still metal, so it could still fit in a pretty wicked glove um, if it came down to it. So it's a really great example of how people are actually fighting in armor in a contemporary setting um and making making the art the equipment work for them and i have to say i have a huge amount of appreciation for anyone who wants to wear a full uh suit of metal armor especially in protective suits but in these cases a lot of them actually is quite heavy and so it's very uh labor time i think to put it on and wear it yeah and um, so, speaking of the Texas heat and Texas specifically, um, you know, one of the things that we have found and we have a lot of in the show um, are other armor pieces. And so, um, we have the other armor here that can qualify our productive energy. I think the next on the list. No, I think we have that coming up. So, we'll move on to weather right now. Um, Oh, sorry, that's my bad. I, I, I jumped ahead to my um, place. Just really quickly, we kind of want to miss out on the most incredible thing of armor and design by Zephyr Studios. Zephyr uh, is a cosplayer, and he specifically designed this uh, particular suit for his own body using a web cast that he created on his own. And he inputted that into um, a digital uh, computer program called 360. And he created this. This is his Laura costume, which is a character from Overwatch. Some of you might be familiar with this character. But in terms of the engineering that went into this suit, this is absolutely incredible. Um, And so he was able to work with programmable LEDs to replicate the cryonic reactions. You're seeing this wonderful um, kind of energy that's coming from this cryonic reactor here that's all uh, through programmable LED lights. One also I'd like to point out in comparison to the heaviness, the weightiness of Michael's armor, which is more traditional. Zephyr is giving you the feel of really heavy, sturdy armor, but he's really designing this work with the understanding that he will be wearing this particular suit for long periods of time. So a lot of the materials that he's choosing to work with are relatively lightweight. You have this wonderful foam here. Um, you're also thinking about how easy it would be to um, basically put on or take off the pieces. So He's working with high-powered magnets to actually attach some of the components to Laura's costume. Um, and I just am so impressed by uh, also every little detail that you've taken from the snow for the video game, which includes these wonderful light-up shoes that he built that also embrace the same, you know, the colored purple light that you see um, in the chaotic reaction. Melissa, do you have anything that you'd like to add? No, I think that you pretty much covered it. Um, one of the things that really makes this so remarkable is how Zephyr embodies the character when he cares the outfit. So, watching this video, 
um, taken by a creative collaborative duo called Corbett and uh, Liz Gordon. Um, Shell is discovered not only in the costume in an actual con setting, but they also added some special effects to replicate some of the powers that Moira has in Overwatch um, and which complement her very fantastical armor. Um, but which, of course, Zephyr has recreated for tangible existence in the real world. Very, very, very cool. Um, so I just have to jump the gun of collections of my apologies. But we are in Texas, so that did mean that there were pictures. We found a lot of really amazing papers who worked in leather specifically. So this is our leather section. I guess we could start with um, Asparian Armour over here. So one facet. You know, a big um, particular gathering um, point for people in Texas for leather makers is the Texas Warehouse Books Festival. And a lot of these leather vendors do specifically show during the Renaissance Festival. You know, it is the largest Renaissance Festival in the country. And so it has a quite a long um, And it's something that we hope to look forward to sometime later this fall. Yeah. So, so yeah, the Renaissance Festival and other similar festivals in Waxahachie and at Sherwood Forest Fair um, feature a lot of work by leather workers like Asgardians who have a storefront at TRF. And what we were just seeing on the camera here is a really beautiful process of how they take the raw leather, carve into it, and then finish it. And this, is, of course, is the open version of these gauntlets that we see here. So like Michael, Asgardians makers do draw on historical motifs, but they also are infusing them with a heavy dose of fantasy, as seen in this dragon motif on the um, bracers. But also here we see them bringing a very purely historical motif. Um, I don't know if we can get that full shield out, um, but this is a Scottish shield known as a target. A target. Um, basically, they were used by Highland warriors in the 16th, uh, up to the 17th century. They were strongly associated with Scottish identity and the desire for independence until they were effectively crushed by the English. And this was this was turned into a bit of a malign symbol. So holding on to the target meant holding on to a sense of Scottish independence. So you can see the Celtic knotwork here, the thistle, a very distinctive symbol of Scotland. Um, and so it has all these features and historical, you know, design. And I don't know if you can get a view of behind, but you can see behind here, there is fur on the back. And apart from these mounting cleats, the shield is designed to have two openings for your arm to go through. So if this was the back of the shield, my arm would be like this to hold it, which gives it a very robust place, sturdy holding spot for that. Um, so that's a historically inspired piece of leather work here at the Targi. And uh, Catherine, do you want to talk a little bit about what we're going to talk about here? So another one of the leather work that we actually have is the Targi Leather Research Project. Um, so one of the leather work that we have to do is really bother me to put that in the end of the day. I will say, he's a little bit of our outsider in the show. He's grandfathered in. <laughs> 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 But he's currently living in Hawk, um, and uh, you know, is really such a master of leather He works on Weaver Weather Supply, and he's doing these wonderful tutorial videos of how to work with leather. Of course, these students are wonderful, but they're of a lot of the other people to create these beautiful. I will mention that Chuck has contributed to um, all different kinds of projects that we are going to mention. I have a lot of other people coming out of here and here again. I'm going to try to give you three years for her, okay? Um, as well as learning pipeline. Uh, but what I really love about Chuck's work is really his attention to detail and how he's making clear and delicate a lot of the leather that he's. So, um, if you look up at the wonderful detail that uh, Renee is showing you now, you can see that the beautiful lace that is incorporated into the shoulders of this particular suit. Um, you also have um, 
In terms of detailing here, he's anodized this wonderful chainmail in purple to match the purple of the rest of the suit. So again, the touch of the eye for detail and really worth pointing out. Anything else you'd like to say? I think so, Seth. You know, these are a really beautiful mix of different swords and I'm inspired suit um, some armor to take some inspiration from the 12th century. So there are some elements that are common to sort of beautiful Western European armor styles, but there are elements that are some of the perfect clouds. So you think the helmet of interest, the dust and some of the details. So he's kind of creating a classical mix of historical and adaptive elements to create a cohesive whole. Um, so we're going to make another pit stop in Canada, the world of high fantasy. Um, this is another piece by Asparian. Um, this is called Specifically, this um, sort of hard edged Celtic motif that draws in a little bit of Nordic, um, you know, influences and patterning. But this is actually a style that was codified more or less by the illustrator Alan Lee, who worked on illustrating J.R.R. Tolkien's Hobbit and Lord of the Rings novels and really became sort of an accepted and understood and recognized style associated with a fantasy race of dwarves. So if you look at any Lord of the Rings art books, you would recognize some of this more geometrical knot work, which Asgardian, uh, Kenneth Dodgen of Asgardian did all of this detailing by hand. Um, and it's a very large and imposing suit, as you can see. I mean, I'm five, two and a half. And I was um, and so one of the things that we really love about this is that it's a very imposing and frightening suit of armor, but he's also like on his way to work because he's holding a messenger bag. And I don't know if you can kind of get a sense of him, you know, in this mode, commuting, axe in, axe in the ground, messenger bag close to the subway. Um, but one thing I did want to also point out specifically is this really beautiful honeycomb-like shaped chainmail skirt that's on the bottom. Um, it's a really unusual shape. And again, it was made by hand by Kenneth and the Asgardian armors. And so it's just something really special that you know adds a lot to the believability and the functionality of this armor. And it really goes so well with a lot of the surface design on the rest of the suit. Um, really, again, you can use this part on Tuck's work, but um, kind of the rest of the ad guardian painting as well. Um, so you really have an eye for detail. Mm -hmm. So moving so, back into the world of cosplay, Catherine, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about Lutavia's work? Sure. So Lutavia um, is also like Zephyr, a cosplayer. And is creating um, these wonderfully inspired suits that are from um, also from Overwatch as well. Yeah. So uh, what we're looking at now is um, Dimitri, who's a character from Fire Emblem. Well, I was supposed to say yes, Fire Emblem. Yes. Yeah, among other things, he has said. So this is a strategy tactics game, but it's very popular because all of the characters are very charismatic. And so Dimitri, I think, is a little bit of like a romantic interest character, very suave and debonair, um, which I think comes through in the fine trappings of his outfit and the sort of pose, you know, very jaunty. 
Um, but there was a lot of detailing that we take it to, to kind of realize the authenticity of this costume. Right, and I think, you know, one thing that I really admire about these cosplayers as well is that, you know, they are really kind of thinking again about the wearability of these pieces and working to create these uh, suits um, that, you know, are fitted to their own bodies and are kind of, you know, um, really kind of teaching themselves and they have a wonderful skill sharing community where they're teaching each other different techniques. And so you can see that there's these beautifully printed um, 3D components to the suit, but you're also going to see this wonderful sewing job, but also working with different kinds of glues and things to combine pieces or pinning different areas. Um, so that it's really well fitted to the image body. Yeah, one of the major uh, design challenges in cosplay in general is that you know, fictional characters from video games and film exist in a universe that has fundamentally different physics than our reality. And so when people are recreating a lot of these costumes, they're having to compensate for things like gravity and inertia that don't factor into video games. So that makes a lot of these builds all the more impressive for their detail and for faithfulness to the original designs. Um, just wanted to talk about a little element of the cosplay that I'm um, speaking myself, and I think it's really exemplified by this piece here, which is another Fire Emblem character called um, Charlotte, who um, is basically a berserker, um, which is, you know, it's a style of warrior who goes into a fugue state and is very powerful and deals out epic damage, right? That's how that works in gameplay as a clash. But of course, as you can see here, Charlotte is very cute. She has nice pearl detailing on her axe as well as on her outfit. And so she's a combination of cute but deadly. So you can get the sense of her personality based on what she's wearing. And that's part of what drew Utavia to recreate this because there was something really charming about this combination of being very princessy and very cute and a little bratty, but also being able to dole out epic damage with a gigantic axe and like spikes on her pauldrons. Um, so I think that's another thing is that the creating the, the costumes say a lot about the personalities of the characters, but it also allows people to really enter into the persona of the character and sort of embody those characteristics that would have made that character appeal to them in the first place. Well said, well said. <laughs> Do we want to move on? Yeah, I know we're, we're probably getting on. So another wonderful question that we wanted to be able to bring in both Phineas and Grace, Devin Holden of My Bed Bed Productions, and Devin, we chose to focus on that were inspired by the Marvel film Black Panther. And this particular um, piece, you know, Devin worked with a number of two collaborators, friends of hers, and each kind of created their own version of the Marvel Ratchet and Black Panther, which is the female warrior character in Black Panther. Uh, and they create such a large amount of changes um, to as well as making themselves um, different skill sets for instance that Devin worked on a film screen shot to another team redesigned the character's pattern and so she had transferred some of the actual um, cloth that the warrior would have worn and then I also just really wanted to bring out this beautiful collaborative piece here that Devin actually hand dated which think about the hours and hours of work that went into these pieces of fabric, that a lot of the components we tailored or inspired from different um, designs of um, various different cultures uh, and African cultures from the Thai tribes for instance, which you can really see here in the circus pattern, um, and the design from a number of different sources of historic uh, circus designs. Um, um, the relationship to uh, Japan 
Um, their design and evolution was really helping them push these passions to the next level. But they also got to meet Nick Carter, who's the award winning designer who designed the costuming for Black Panther. And one thing that Devin relayed to us was that while she decided to handmade her fabric based on the screenshots, when she met Nick Carter, Ruth said to her, Oh my gosh, this is so beautiful. We just have to make them on because that allows the actors to look better. And you really can't tell a lot of scenes whether or not it's handmade. And so I think that's a really amazing detail that Devin took that faithful recreation to this level. And, um, you know, even Ruth Carter herself is very impressed. I think that's a great, a great story. Um, and I guess I just want to kind of take a moment um, to recognize uh, both of uh, Devin's collaborators which is both um, Afro-Queen cosplay and Black-Queen cosplay. And so please make sure to check out their pages as well on Instagram, because they also uh, have different creativity in the work that they do. And I'm excited to see what they might continue doing together in the future. Yeah, absolutely. So I think we have one more Zoom meeting to do here today. Um, so um, we're going to finish here with the work of uh, Jesse Arts and Jesse Art. Uh, Jesse is a San Antonio based leather worker, um, and she has a number of different series, including this one, which is inspired by Instagram and Pathos, so from the Planetized Monster Hunter. Um, of course, Jesse's skill with surface techniques and surface finishes that really render leather into a completely different seeming material. So she's recreated this bone-like dry seeming surface, and it's actually supple leather. She can move in it, and she has at times outfitted a suit with LED lights so that it can illuminate certain components. Um, another extremely tall and fairly imposing suit of armor. I love this one because there's an undeniable femininity about it, and that it's terrifying. But you also feel like you can move around quietly and very dangerous and selfie, which is very cool. Catherine, do you want to add anything? Oh, we can also take a look at the sword she made, too. Yeah. I think, you know, like, the difference, too, is that people have a background in being a blind, and I think that she really has such a capability to bring these characters to life in the way that she's working with the surface design of these pieces, including this wonderful detail of this very, um, imposing kind of monster face on this particular sword. Um, she's really kind of bringing that to life and the way that she's working to create shadow and depth um, just on the surface of this particular uh, weather as well. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, one thing I just want to note about this as well is that, um, you know, just like Nevada and the collaborators, Jesse derived this design from a single screenshot and a fairly pixelated one at that because in memory series, this was a reasonably early version of Monster Hunter. So he really, really took this all the way and turned from a pixelated icon to fully realized to be suited weather armor. And I think that's one of the really amazing things that cosplayers can do. So I think that's everything. I think that I wanted to be able to.